Good afternoon. Good morning and um, good evening to, um, to some of you who's with us from Asia. Um, a warm welcome first to all of you, to students, welcome to you, uh, welcome to alumni, welcome to faculty, welcome to friends of the house. Welcome to uh, all of you other people who somehow managed to pick up this invitation online or somewhere else. A warm welcome to you too. And welcome to our distinguished speaker and this year's annual Johannes Slyk lecturer, Samuel Moin. And so we are finally here, not physically as we had hoped for, but online on Zoom again. But uh, most importantly, we're here in, in spirit. Due to the pandemic, we had to uh, reschedule the annual Slick Lecture with Samuel Moyne from 2020 to 2021. Uh, it left open the question about whether this is actually the 2020 or the 2021 Slick Lecture event. Uh, well, I and the rest of the annual Slick Lecture Committee, which is Louise Ronien, who's a PhD student here, and Simon Axe, who's director of Testro Højskole have decided for 2021 so that we will always remember 2020 as the year the pandemic broke out. Let me first say a few words about Johannes Slyk and the Slyk lecture before I introduce Samuel Moyne to all of you and then motivate why the Slyk committee decided to ask Sam to be our 2021 annual Slyk lecturer. Johannes Slyk founded the Department for the History of Ideas at Aarhus University in 1967 and served as professor at that department until 1974. His intellectual horizon and research interests were wide ranging, but most of his, uh, or much of his work was dedicated to Kierkegaard, extensionism, absurdity, ancient philosophy, the Renaissance and Christianity. In honor of Slick's significance for Danish research in intellectual history, the annual Johannes Slick lecture was inaugurated in 2006. And on a personal note, I can, uh, I can reveal that one of my very first entry points myself into the history of ideas were exactly some of the works by Slick that I read in high school, probably uh, the same for, for quite a few of you. The honor of giving the annual Johannes Slick lecture is given to an internationally recognized and distinguished researcher who has made outstanding contributions in history of ideas within an area that in that broad sense, as it says, our regulations was or would have been of interest to Johannes Slyk. Past Slyk lecturers are distinguished scholars, Manfred Frank, Quinton Skinner, Jonathan Israel, Martin Jay, Tron Bear Eriksen, Anthony Grafton, Anthony Pacton, Hans Jörn Jens, and Annabel Brett. Let me now say a few words about Samuel Moyne. Uh, Samuel Moyne is professor of jurisprudence at Yale Law School and professor of history at Yale University. He received a doctorate in modern European history from the University of California, Berkeley in 2000 and a law degree from Harvard University in 2001. Interestingly, if I am not mistaken, and, and there's people here in the room who would correct me then, uh, please do. This is the second time our annual Slick lecturer had a PhD supervisor who also received the prize. Sam's being Martin Jay, if I remember correctly, Annabel Brett's being Quinton Skinner, if I remember correctly. It seems like our annual Slick Lecturer Institution is getting older, passing the test of time. Moyne came to Yale from Howard University where he was professor of law and history. Before this, he spent 13 years in the Columbia University History Department where he was most recently, James Bryce, Professor of European Legal History. His areas of interest in legal scholarship include international law, human rights, the law of war, and legal thought in both historical and current perspective. In intellectual history, he has worked on a diverse range of subjects, especially 20th century European moral and political theory. He has written several books in his fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, including 
The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, uh, 2010, and edited or co-edited a number of others. His most recent books are Christian Human Rights, 2015, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, 2018. Over the years, he has also participated widely in the public debate as an American public intellectual. His most recent book is his forthcoming Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, which can be pre-ordered already now. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of sounding like a salesperson, I don't know, but it, I wanted to tell you this, should be arriving in the um, autumn. In the book, Moyne asks a troubling but urgent question. What if efforts to make war more ethical, to ban torture and limit civilian casualties have only shored up the military enterprise and made it sturdier. When in a few minutes I pass on the word to Sam, he will be presenting parts of this new fascinating work. It will be interesting to hear how intellectual history can contribute to our understanding of war, efforts to making it more humane and missed opportunities perhaps uh, for ending American warfare. Let me now say a little more about why the committee chose Moyne. We chose him because he had made some um, outstanding contributions to intellectual history. His most known works are within the history of human rights, for, the, for which he has received much praise, alongside also a good amount of criticism from different sides, including uh, human rights advocates. His work has been a critical and provocative renewal of the field of human rights history. Along the way, which is good for us also in other ways, um, people otherwise perhaps not too familiar with the discipline of intellectual history became more familiar with it as they read The Last Utopia and other works. In this way too, I think Moyne's work has been of great importance for our discipline. Moyne has also contributed to a number of anthologies and journals of much importance to our field, co-editing key volumes on, on both European and global intellectual history. The latter can perhaps be designated as a kind of subfield within intellectual history that helped uh, that Moyne helped introduce and map with Andrew Satori in 2013. He also contributed to the very first volume of the journal Modern Intellectual History in 2004 and played a key role in the excellent online journal Humanity, which often features intellectual history content. While most of his writings are on human rights, Moyne has also contributed with work discussing the raison d'etre and approaches of intellectual history. In one such article, which we discussed in yesterday's PhD masterclass with Sam, he argues for what he calls an imaginary intellectual history. In the text, he called for a less defensive intellectual history, which has tended to stick to the realm of representations and ideas also in terms of relevant contexts. He instead introduced the concept of the social imaginary as a, what he calls, promising venture to test and possibly even to overcome the distinction between representations and practices. Bluntly, Moyne goes on to explain, the social imaginary offers an intellectualized view of practices. The more complicated, but ultimately more satisfying dialectical view is that Quote, there is no idea that is not social and no society not ideationally founded, unquote. Ideas are grounded in practices and ideas matter in practices. Exactly how is an open empirical question. Both this interplay and the importance of ideas makes ideas worthwhile studying. For these various contributions to the field of intellectual history, stretching from human rights, uh, history to mappings of European and global intellectual history, to institutional efforts, to contributions, to theoretical and mythological discussions, we in the SLUC Annual Lecture Committee decided to ask Moyne to give the 2020, now 2021, Annual SLUC Lecture. Sam will also be given the chance to talk, uh, believe it or not, he will be talking for about 45 minutes, after which there should be ample time for some questions. If you have a question, please mark with an X in the chat. If our connection starts slowing down, down, I kindly ask you to please turn off your video. If it does not, you're free to turn to keep them on. Please also make sure that you are muted during Sam's talk. This 
uh, session is, is being recorded. I will now give the word to our 2021 annual SLUC lecture. So welcome so much, Sam. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's an enormous privilege to give this lecture, uh, even though it was postponed uh, from last year, and even though I don't have the treat of uh, visiting Denmark this year. I, I actually do many years, um, but it will have to happen some other time. Uh, I wasn't sure myself whether this was the 2020 or 2021 SLUC lecture, but regardless, uh, I uh, uh, am, am happy to give it. And really, uh, given SLUC's contributions and the, the much greater eminence of my predecessors, uh, humbled uh, by the invitation. So, one of the predecessors, Quentin Skinner, famously remarked that once the historicity of thought is taken seriously, it leaves us on our own in the present. In his famous 1969 article, Meaning and Understanding in the History of Ideas, he concludes, we must learn to think for ourselves. Well, I've always thought that's a, a disastrous mistake. Uh, not only are we constituted in our thinking by the past, but there, there can't be any reason to study it except for the help it could provide in orienting ourselves in our present and facing some of its burning questions. What point is there otherwise? As a kind of object lesson, I hope persuasive of that position, I'd like to begin in the present with the question I began to ponder a couple of years ago, how we can properly conceptualize what has gone wrong in the war on terror of America, the United States and its allies, which includes many Western European countries, uh, if anything went wrong. And I, I, I focused because I, I, like you, have lived through a very long war on terror now, coming up on two full decades, on the latter part of it, when it has become less controversial, even less visible than at the start. Even so, it's enormously violent. Uh, and it's tempting and no doubt uh, inevitable to conclude that if there's anything wrong with the war on terror, it's, it's violence, either because the wrong kind of violence has been administered, uh, immoral or illegal violence, whether torture uh, or civilian casualties, or just too much uh, violence, even when it's legal. I uh, began to think that uh, one of the hallmarks of this war on terror, without denying the outrage of ongoing violence, is its nonviolence or its diminishing violence, especially when that diminishing violence. Uh, makes uh, the war on terror something that war may always have been, uh, uh, let's say, beneath the, the visible wrong of violence, namely a, a quest for kind of domination of some people over other peoples. Uh, and uh, especially when it trends in a nonviolent direction, without, of course, giving up its bloodshed. Uh, what if we're seeing a transformation in the annals of warfare, which we've associated with pain, injury, death since Homer, and seeing a new face of it emerging that 
involves an increasingly nonviolent control. Uh, now, I don't think it's a virtue of the war on terror if it if I'm right about this feature of it, that it's revealed something about warfare that may have been harder to see before. But if it has, then we need to try to understand uh, how to think about the most prestigious, the most vivid reform project uh, and indeed oppositional project in the era of what uh, some call the forever war. And that's to make it more humane, uh, to purge it of its torture as its worst feature under George W. Bush, to invade uh, when uh, drones strike, uh, even though they mostly surveil and kill too many people, especially too many civilians, a disproportionate number to the military advantage gained by the strike. Uh, and so I, I, I began to worry that that form of, of opposition to calls for reform to the war on terror, humanization of the war on terror could be part of its endlessness and therefore could be part of this new feature of war that seems like it's emerging. War as increasingly nonviolent control. And it's for that reason that I looked back to the past to find figures in our canon, our canon of the history of ideas that Johannes Luck studied. Uh, to try to understand what could be a way of thinking about the humanization of endless war. Uh, uh, and I'm going to present today just one figure whom I found, I think, perhaps the most useful that I've run across, uh, Leo Tolstoy. Uh, this is, as Christian mentioned, part of a new project. It's uh, a lecture that tries to cover, uh, because this is a history of ideas occasion, Tolstoy as a historical uh, a thinker who might give a framework relevant now. And so it's just helping uh, get at the framework uh, for the rest of the history of American war and the war on terror that I narrate in my book. I'll, I'll mainly talk about Tolstoy given the occasion, but I, I'll, I'll save some time at the end of the lecture to address how his insights uh, might or might not apply to war. Uh, so it, Tolstoy had, as you all know uh, from school, an extremely long career, uh, but his anxiety about the humanization of war, I found in looking back from our present on his works, uh, had a presence throughout his life. But we can distinguish roughly three stages in his grappling with the potential uh, uh, evil he saw and denounced in the humanization of war. As a young man, of course, he went to war himself uh, and served uh, uh, as an officer in the Crimean War. It was at this time, whiling away the, uh, the days and months he spent uh, uh, in Sevastopol, in the Crimea, uh, that he penned some sketches uh, called the Sevastopol sketches that accounted not for his global fame that was reserved for later, but made him a recognized Russian author. And these sketches consist essentially of description of what it was like uh, to arrive at the city uh, in the midst of siege uh, and to uh, be part of, of that uh, uh, agonizing event. And right from the start in these first sketches, 
he raises a concern about the humanization of war. In uh, the second sketch, he describes how one day, uh, though they're not obliged to do so, the generals on the two sides of the Crimean War decided to take a pause in their death dealing uh, 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 against one another, to go out to collect the dead uh, or to succor those who were bleeding out on the battlefield uh, and, if possible, save their lives. Uh, it was uh, something that may remind us of later events in the history of warfare, uh, European warfare, like the Christmas Day pause during World War I. But when Tolstoy's narrator reaches this moment of charity, of philanthropy, of humanity in the siege of Sevastopol, he is horrified because it seems hypocritical to him. These are Christians. They recognize the great law of love. Uh, and they come out to witness the grisly effects of their fighting to bury those who are already dead and to heal those who can be saved. And if they took Christianity seriously, Tolstoy says, they would fall to their knees, but they don't. Uh, instead, they think of humanity as a pause, as an intermission. Uh, and it's unclear to him whether that's a, a betrayal of these values of charity and love and humanity or of some way of honoring it in amidst the evil of our world. He concludes that it's a betrayal. The scraps of white cloth will be put away and once again, the engines of death and suffering will start their whistling. And once again, the blood of the innocent will flow and the air will be filled with groans and cursing. Now, at this early stage in Tolstoy's authorship, this is just an indictment of hypocrisy, nothing more. There's nothing that sophisticated about Tolstoy's critique of uh, Christian charity or a broader sense of humanity that might affect the conduct of war, just as a kind of choice that generals make. 10 years later, he wrote War and Peace. And then this second stage, I propose that we can see a deepening in his understanding of where the hypocrisy might lie, where, what the exact problem in humane warfare is. Uh, about two thirds of the way through the novel, uh, Tolstoy puts in Prince Andrei's mouth the, as uh, his spokesman perhaps, but certainly one of the two leading characters of the book, a speech about the humanization of war. Uh, it's the night actually before the great battle of Barodino at which Andre himself will be wounded, uh, it turns out, mortally. But Andre says that he would not take humanity seriously if he were in charge of the war. What I would do if I had power would be not to take prisoners. They talk of the laws of warfare and humanity of the wounded to the wounded, that's all rubbish. Now for background, I mentioned that at Sevastopol, it was purely a choice of the generals to humanize their warfare. Similarly, at this time in European history, it was not an obligation of armies, not only to take care of their own dead, but uh, to take care of prisoners that they might have a chance to capture. They could, commanders could kill those prisoners, offering no quarter. 
still, it was emerging as an ethical belief that it would be better if prisoners were taken, especially when men uh, attempted to surrender. Prince Andrei says, we should not honor that ethical impulse to humanize war. Now, this is a speculative proposal and it's hard to establish given the timing of the revisions of war and peace. And it depends on how we translate the word that is here, the laws of warfare. But it's an amazing fact that just at the time that uh, Tolstoy was revising war and peace, European states met and for the first time in 1864 passed a, a, a legal treaty that regulated war, the conduct of it within an international law. It's known as the Geneva Convention of 1864 and it is the founding document of what we now call international humanitarian law. Its precise topic was taking care uh, of the wounded in warfare when states failed to do so. And it required states to allow independent uh, do-gooders, eventually the Red Cross, uh, to take on the role of burying the dead, ministering to the wounded. Uh, the Swiss gentleman who's gotten credit for the idea of the Geneva Convention was Henri Dunant, who eventually won the, uh, the first Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, uh, and I wonder if in his revisions, Tolstoy had this event in mind they talk of the laws of warfare. Well, this was a new event uh, in European history at this moment. Humanity to the wounded, the very thing he'd been anxious about at Sevastopol. But Andrei says, it's all rubbish. Why? What's rubbish about it? Well, he goes on to say that not taking prisoners would make war less cruel. If we didn't pretend war is a game, we shouldn't do it unless it was really important. Uh, now, the suggestion there is that if we leave war the way it is, unhumanized, it will break out less frequently. Ironically, the ultimate horizon of this argument is diminishing cruelty very explicitly. And the claim is, is like a, an empirical conjecture that if war were more brutal, it would happen less frequently and therefore there would be less overall cruelty in spite of all the brutality when it breaks out. Now, this was a popular view. Uh, it was a rationalization actually for intense warfare, not usually on the grounds that it would break out less frequently as Prince Andre conjectured. Usually the conjecture in the hands of Karl von Clausewitz and the first uh, author of a national code to regulate warfare, Francis Lieber in the United States. The idea, the conjecture was that brutal war would be briefer. Either way, the, the claim was that uh, uh, the regulation of warfare, ironically, in the name of humanity would make it worse, more cruel uh, overall. Now, this is an interesting proposal uh, I think it's outrageous. Uh, uh, it's a guess. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's speculation. And it seems to me difficult to sustain just because we know of many brutal wars that have gone on a long time. And as far as I can tell, the project uh, of, of making uh, war 
more humane as it's gone on, especially in the 20th century, has tended to correlate with less frequent interstate war, at least. So the idea that we should have in Prince Andrei's spirit left war brutal for the conjectural reasons he cites seems dubious, but I wonder if there's something to it. I think Tolstoy thought there was, and in the continuation of his thinking, uh, uh, tried to uh, salvage something durable in this argument. Instead of focusing so much on the good effects of a bad cause as Prince Andre did, as we'll see, Tolstoy tried to dev devise some arguments that this good one, making war humane, though good, though potentially worth undertaking, could have some perverse effects, some risks worth considering. Still conjectural, but to me, more plausible. And it's really that I want to um, pursue in what follows, specifically Tolstoy's development after War and Peace of some new conjectures about how humanity, the humanization of warfare, could entrench warfare, make it more durable and harder to end. First, let me just mention in passing that uh, there were a lot of dubious conjectures lying around 19th century intellectual history. Uh, uh, Henri Dunant's great successor as the leader of the Red Cross, another Swiss gentleman named Gustave Moignier, offered the exact opposite uh, conjecture uh, once when he was speaking to his funders, when he said that, no, it's actually the case that making war humane will make it less uh, likely to, to break out, might end warfare altogether someday the exact opposite of Prince André's suggestion. And uh, Moignier's belief uh, was that uh, we could think of the humanization of war as like a foot in the door, uh, a first step, if you will, on a longer road. Uh, and from a humanization, pacif pacification, pac pacification, would arise. As he says, the humanization of war could only end in its abolition. Now, I just want to note that this is very much like Prince Andre's suggestion. Uh, it's, it's interested in the minimization of cruelty. It's a conjecture about how it can best be achieved or most likely can be achieved. Uh, and it's wrong. Uh, much like Prince Andre's conjecture because it's just hard to believe at this late date that humanized wars uh, uh, are leading to the end of war. Actually, from the perspective of Tolstoy's ultimate argument that I wanna focus on in most of the remainder of the talk, it seems like the reverse. Now, I just wanna mention Moignier who really does never won the Nobel Prize uh, but was was the leader for decades of the International Red Cross and deserves a lot more credit in our memory of uh, of 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 good and evil than he's received. Uh, was open to the possibility that he was wrong. It, in a very honorable moment, uh, in an obscure German publication that I have shown you on the slide. He wondered, could it be possible that instead of leading to pacification, the laws of war would lead to endless war, would accompany an endless and humane form of war, which maybe the technology did not yet exist to conduct. And he responded, I think very forthrightly and very honorably, that if that ever happened, he, the founder of the Red Cross, would quit his job because no longer could humanization be seen as an ally of peace, but was its enemy. And that is what Tolstoy insisted. In the third and last stage I wanna cover with you, uh, Tolstoy famously 
uh, came to Jesus. Uh, he'd foreseen this already in his youth, but it took him a while to uh, give up war, give up women, uh, give up meat eating, give up slave holding or serf holding. He did so as a one of Europe's great sages, the world's great sages, uh, given his influence on 20th century uh, figures like Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And he took a, a radical opposition to violence as such uh, due to his own reading of the gospels and especially the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I've emphasized that Prince Andrei's argument, like Gustave Moynier's argument, were consequentialists. They assess conjecturally outcomes. And uh, Tolstoy's general position after his conversion to his own personal Christianity was no longer consequentialist. Uh, violence was wrong uh, no matter what. Uh, However, I want to show you that even in his third period, he, he continued making conjectures, and in particular about the potentially baleful effects of making war humane. And I think it's here that he's of great value to us in the present. What I think is inspiring about Tolstoy's uh, intellectual uh, agenda in this late period uh, chaotic though it was, is that he proceeded by comparing the project of making war humane with other attempts to humanize violent corporal practices in his past and in his present. In particular, the attempt to humanize chattel slavery and the attempt to humanize the slaughter of animals, non-human animals, of course. And what I want to focus on uh, not that Tolstoy was any kind of wannabe social scientist, uh, that I want to focus on the fact that his arguments are very useful in identifying what we can call the, the agents and mechanisms whereby the humanization of war might make it more durable or endless. Uh, so he he's continues to be a, a causal theorist and a conjectural theorist about humanization. So let's start with the first. Uh, Tolstoy looks back. He tried to free his serfs in the, in the early 1860s. They wouldn't leave his estate. Uh, but of course, the Russian Empire freed the serfs a couple of years before Americans fought a civil war that involved the end of chattel slavery in, in their part of North America. Uh, and after this period, when America and Russia give up these immemorial uh, practices of chattel slave, slavery and serfdom. Tolstoy looks back at what had been for the longest time the dominant moral reform project with respect to those practices and which took the form of humanization. If we look at most of the law across the Atlantic passed around slavery uh, and human bondage, it conceded it entrenched the property right that one human being might have in another human being. It placed limits on what masters could do to their serfs and slaves, in particular, limited cruelty. In the Anglo-American world, first the British Empire and then early uh, you know, American history, this was known as amelioration. Uh, and it's true that uh, most reform to, came in the guise of humanization of slavery. From the 1870s and 80s, Tolstoy looks back and says, that was a disastrous error morally to concede the longevity of the practice of slavery in order merely to call for its humanization, especially if it made the practice more durable. Tolstoy indicted those who at the time made a bet and a compromise. Their bet was that they couldn't end slavery anytime soon. Their compromise was to work with slavers 
to concede to slavers their property rights in order to impose other obligations uh, on how they treated those slaves. And one of the best historians of this era, an African-American scholar named Winthrop Jordan, has actually written that this bet and choice made slavery more durable. Uh, and Tolstoy's suggestion is, why make the same mistake with war? Now, let's call this the advocate's compromise. If abolition is available or when it can become an available agenda, if we merely humanize a violent practice uh, following a logic of compromise, uh, then we may risk the entrenchment of the practice. So on this scheme, Tolstoy develops an analogy between the ameliorator and the slaveholder on the one hand and the humanitarian and the military uh, and state whose, whose right to conduct war is conceded uh, in order to work with militaries and states to get them to agree to make their warfare less brutal. Now, maybe this, the same causal argument that Winthrop Jordan made about slavery doesn't apply to uh, war, and it's worth mentioning that possibility. We now know that it was possible to end slavery. Maybe it's not possible to end war. Uh, maybe there are just wars that we need to keep in play uh, and not abolish altogether. Uh, maybe what Gustave Moignier said about war, though false about slavery, could apply to war. That maybe making uh, slavery humane and trench slavery, but maybe making war humane could actually lead to some pacification. Uh, uh, and just as an example of that, consider after 9-11, when many people realized that the war on terror or the war in Iraq was a mistake, even if they'd supported it, uh, uh, and in the patriotic haze of American and transatlantic life of the moment, uh, it was impossible to come out against the war. Uh, maybe the war on terror itself was just and the Iraq war was a deviation. But what if we criticize the way it was being fought as a way of delegitimating war and leaving only the, the, the just war uh, 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 as, as a kind of remainder. Well, I, I want to suggest that uh, even if we should consider these uh, counter arguments, Tolstoy's first analogy to chattel slavery is really powerful because it gives us a concrete example of a time when humanization entrenched and, 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 and created an, a, a, a relatively more endless evil. Okay, let's turn to the second case before concluding with some thinking about, you know, some more direct thinking about the war on terror today. Tolstoy's second fundamental analogy is between war and, and the slaughter of, of non-human animals. Already in War and Peace, Prince Andre had offered this analogy when he said that rules that were trying to make war more humane were like the magnanimity and sensibility of a lady who turned sick at the sight of the slaughtered calf. She's so kind-hearted, she can't see blood, but she eats fricasseed veal with a very good appetite. Now, interestingly, I don't think Tolstoy scholars have seen this. When Tolstoy became the world's most famous vegetarian uh, after his conversion, he visited a slaughterhouse and not his local uh, shop, but uh, the new slaughterhouse in uh, the big town near his estate called Tula, uh, precisely because he wanted to see what the modern humane form of slaughter was like. And unlike the factory farms of his day, of our day, 
this slaughterhouse let him in. And he wrote a, an amazing text called The First Step. Once again, he in gender terms imagines a lady who's sensitive uh, enough to demand the humanization of slaughter, but of course eats the results. And the reason this is problematic is that the humanization of her kill that she demands from new slaughterhouses makes her think she's a good person. She proceeds with full assurance that she's doing right. Now let's call this in contrast to the advocate's compromise, the beneficiary's bad faith. Tolstoy is focusing here not on reformers who are making compromises, but on the audience or the beneficiaries of violence who think they're better people because they've demanded not an end to the violence, but uh, a more mild form. Uh, now, this is we can call bad faith. It's a moral error on its own, but I assume it takes on real significance if it has some causal effect in the same way that the advocates compromise did. Uh, Winthrop Jordan said the advocates compromise makes the evil of durable. Well, in the same way, the beneficiary's bad faith becomes noxious to the extent it makes slaughter more durable. Now we can argue again, uh, whether all of this is true about war, just as Tolstoy insists it is. It's the whole point of his analogy is to suggest that humanizing war will lead to a lot of bad faith among those who then assume that humanized war that they support makes them good people, even when uh, lots of violence in their name uh, for their sake continues. I want to suggest it's very clear in this case that making non-human animal slaughter more humane has done nothing to provide a stepping stone to vegetarianism. Actually, the reverse. It seems to have allowed much more massive meat production uh, in history since the 19th century than Tolstoy could ever have imagined. And so once again, we have to ask, was Tolstoy onto something in this very clear case of, uh, of, of non-human animal slaughter that's applicable to the humanization of war? Okay, so that's it for Tolstoy. So I wanna conclude in my last 10 minutes by reflecting with you on what we take from this. I actually think Tolstoy, like so many prophets, was ahead of his time. Uh, the Geneva Convention was one thing, but most of the law of war was not about making war humane until our time, especially because it wasn't much observed by states and armies, even when they made treaties. It's true that Tolstoy was operating in a period in which states had the right to conduct war, and now they don't. Uh, we call this use ad bellum, and much of the uh, development of international law in the 20th century was about placing at least some constraints on states from going to war. And so we might argue now that we've achieved that constraint through the United Nations Charter and other devices, it's, it's a different matter to worry about the enabling or entrenching or facilitative effect of rules humanizing the conduct of war, so-called use and bellow. Maybe that's true, but I think the war on terror shows very vividly that uh, this is a real effect that Tolstoy was worrying about ahead of his time, not least since America and other powers that fight with it have eroded constraints on going to war in our time in a series of ways and let's say compensated for this with advertising the humanity of their wars. Uh, 
And as the war on terror has evolved beyond its classic early period of the uh, direct intervention with lots of troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think we've seen Tolstoy's concerns become uh, ever more applicable because we've seen a new form of the war on terror come in the later years of George W. Bush's presidency, most especially through the good offices of Barack Obama and even under Donald Trump, of a form of the war on terror that is less about um, a large scale deployment and much more about what we can call light or no footprint war, uh, which goes lots more places. You know about the drones. Uh, you see there that America has built a massive drone infrastructure, including uh, in sub Saharan Africa, not just in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Equally, uh, it's turned to special forces, small bands of men and women who visit, minimize civilian casualties when they have a target, as we've seen repeatedly in recent years, and strike. Amazingly, my country's special forces set foot in 70 to 80% of the world's countries on an annual basis in recent years, up from 30 or 40. Uh, and so we're seeing now a genuinely global war on terror that's less visible. And part of the reason is what Tolstoy worried about. It's humanization. This happened for reasons I explore in the book. I think there was a big break in the 1970s. First of all, when uh, there were new laws of war written, uh, called the Additional Protocols to the Geneva Conventions, originally drafted in 1949. The 1970s updates to those rules really are the first ones that make aerial warfare more humane and require states in all kinds of warfare to contain civilian casualties. More than this, uh, we see a move both by civil society and the military to compromise around um, the ethics of fighting war. Anti-war movements died uh, after the 1960s and they've been replaced by humanization movements, including within the military. And so you have a classic advocates compromise, uh, just of the kind that Tolstoy feared, in which uh, advocates, compromise and, and then fight with militaries about whether the wars are humane enough yet. We can see this very directly after the Cold War. The first Gulf War was the first war that a, a group called Human Rights Watch monitored for violations of the laws of war and was also the first war in which military lawyers helped pick targets in part because some might be illegal. After 9-11, I think Tolstoy's syndrome became really vivid because after the one day of the most massive anti-war protest in human history in 2003, the two chief debates around the war on terror have been precisely about whether it's humane or not. I refer, of course, to the torture debate in 2004 through six, uh, and the debate under Barack Obama's administration, much more minor around civilian casualties with the drone posture that he assumed. Maybe it's true that some who denounced torture in 2004 through six were covertly pacifist, at least with respect to this war. They wanted, they were an anti-war movement in intention, but in effect, they removed a bug from the program of endless war. And amazingly, most of the debate around drones has not been around their basic 
morality, but around whether they kill too many collaterally. Once again, a real concern because they do kill too many collaterally, but a concern that uh, could function just as Tolstoy worried. Reformers making compromises not to indict the war, not to indict the drone, not to indict the globalization of special forces, but to complain about their excessive brutality. And for audiences, I'm suggesting, for beneficiaries, bad faith has loomed large as the war on terror has become less controversial in and through its humanization as those who have worked for or trusted in a more humane form of the war on terror uh, thought they were good people when their states were doing bad things. Okay, you know, this is controversial, but I also think that one reason for Donald Trump's rise is that we ceded to him the argument that the war itself was noxious, which he definitely made, as you can see, before his Twitter account was shut down. So final thoughts, you know, um, my own view is that we should reject Prince Andre. We should not want war to be more brutal, but we should accept the later Tolstoy's concern about the risks that accrue whenever we humanize violence. Uh, namely that we entrench it and that we think hard about the two mechanisms he identified. If that's true, then we would never want to abandon, uh, if, if not a pacifist politics, because I'm personally not a pacifist, then an anti-war concern alongside a concern about the humanity of war, since after all, most wars are fought pretextually for no good reason, lead to disastrous outcomes and the war on terror, I, I believe fits all three of those. Uh, uh, and if we've, we've lost our way, I think Tolstoy can help us figure out why, did, why this happened and what, what our alternatives are. Okay, I, I'm gonna conclude just by, um, uh, uh, with one final thought, just because I, I, I do wanna leave lots of time for discussion. I focused in part because Tolstoy focused on corporal wrongs and let's call it literal violence. One thing that chattel slavery, non-human animal slaughter and warfare have in common is that at least one big part of the wrong we're concerned about is violence injury and death, the body and its, and its pain and suffering or its, its fatality. I think that here Tolstoy helps us to a certain extent, but we, if we think more broadly about the war on terror and maybe read Tolstoy more closely, we should conclude that violence is not the problem. After all, it's only fair to acknowledge that wars fought by great powers are becoming less violent uh, in the depths of the carnage, in the scope of the fatalities relative to the recent past and especially the long ago past. Uh, and yet what we're seeing emerge as this novelty of the war on terror is something else beyond the terrible violence that remains. And it's, as I suggested at the start, domination without violence. To me, a drone, of course, is terrible when it strikes, but it's also terrible when it does not strike, which they mostly do not. Uh, they are technologies, not merely of killing, but of surveillance. Uh, and that suggests that 
we're in an era in which a new experiment is underway. Let's call it the editing out of violence, injury and death from war, which again, we, we understandably thought was central to it for millennia from Homer on. Uh, I can talk in the question period if you want about how um, some activists are actually trying to push war more towards policing, which is supposed to be in its dominant forms, nonviolent, uh, even in my country, uh, but especially in yours. And we could ask, is the humanization of war to convert into policing with minimal or nonviolent uh, outcomes as, as the dominant forms, a good or bad thing? Well, I think that would depend on seeing with Tolstoy, but also beyond his examples, that the real concern about humanization is that it entrenches domination uh, and not only violence, but nonviolence of the kind that Tolstoy helped ex inspire in the 20th century uh, is becoming uh, one of the problems, the moral problems we have to ponder uh, if it takes the form of uh, control and domination in the 21st century. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your challenges and questions. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, we're going to, trying to give you a, a virtual applause. I don't know exactly how it works, but uh, I hope you can hear uh, all the applause. Um, thank you so much for this very rich and stimulating talk on a very, very important topic. Um, thank you for, for also uh, telling us about this, this fascinating figure of, of, of Leo Tolstoy. Um, we have uh, some time for questions. And, and please, if you do have a question, uh, you can put an X in the, um, in the chat. And I will try to uh, give you uh, the, the possibility of, 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 of posing those questions in, in, in order. Let me see. Uh, so I have uh, one from uh, Andreas uh, Kjellberg. Uh, please, Andreas. So thank you very much, Samuel, for the uh, enlightening uh, briefing. Um, a question on the uh, on sort of the the uh, assumptions behind the uh, the humanization of war, and also just for clarification, I'm a captain in the Danish army, so that that is my uh, reason for attending. Um, you say that that war fought or being fought by major powers are becoming more humane. And that is a result of a political process towards making wars more humane. But couldn't you, couldn't you exclude that argument by saying that it is also because that the wars being fought at the moment, the wars in Afghanistan, which is now closing down, the war in Iraq, the, the minor conflicts in terms of great power conflict in, in Africa is only because it's not really politically very important for the West. So that would be my, my Clausewitzian argument that since it's not politically very important, we don't need to go full on war. But if it was politically important, we would go full on war. So we need to like take that argument that humanization has become part of war and, and put that aside in order to argue for the total ab abolition of war. Uh, yeah, does it make sense? You're, you're nodding. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's a wonderful question. So, you know, clearly I can't rule out that great power conflict will return. And, you know, hypothetically, especially in kind of existential conflict of the kind you're imagining, we might think that the humanization of war in the recent period was contingent for the reasons you suggest that it really presupposed a particular form of war and a particular form of enemy, not that serious an enemy. Um, so first of all, that I don't know if that's true. Uh, you know, right now there are all kinds of attempts just given the rise of China to, um, 
you know, anticipate a World War III that would be fought more humanely. Um, and we can anticipate that, you know, the initial stages, you know, uh, at least Westerners might have that expectation and impose it on their governments. Remember that, you know, in 1939, there was this outrageous bombing uh, by Japan of a Chinese city, Chongqing. And uh, it, it was an international outrage. And uh, the, the American president and many European leaders denounced it and said, we are not going to permit the bombing of cities in this war. Well, we know what happened. So I don't wanna deny that your scenario could be true. Even if it is, it could require some erosion of the humanization we've tried to kind of build. I think it's quite serious, maybe more serious than you're allowing. So consider some wars that my country has been involved in, the war on terror, uh, and Vietnam just a few decades ago. Uh, uh, before that, you might consider other late imperial wars like the Algerian War or the Malayan counterinsurgency. Uh, and if you just track across, these are similar in the sense that they're not very important in your you know, analytical terms. There's no good reason to fight them, you know, that's existential. There are anti-communist reasons and so forth. Uh, there are anti-terrorist reasons. But the number of, of, of deaths, uh, including on the Western side, but especially on the other side, have fallen drastically. You would much rather be you know, someone out in, in the wilds of Pakistan today under the drones than a rice farmer in Vietnam or a goat herder in Algeria, your chances of dying are very small today because uh, we've seen that there's a more and more uh, 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 intrusive set of expectations on governments and militaries to kill less. And in particular, I, I try to argue in the book that it was after Vietnam and the American case, I believe after decolonization and the European case, that militaries adjusted partly out of ethics, uh, but partly out of optics. Mi Lai had been so shameful, so delegitimating for the American military that officers began to insist that war become humane. Just one act, there was an amazing event around 2005 or six when the commandant of West Point, the American Army's military school, flew to Hollywood. And he did so in order to demand that the producers of the television show 24 stop glamorizing torture. Now, I think this is an utterly extraordinary event because, you know, in the old days of the Prussian army, we were concerned about the civilians exercising control over the military. But here it's the reverse, that you have the military demanding humanity from a civilian populace De baying for blood, asking for torture. So this is, I, I believe, a novelty. Um, and it suggests that while, of course, humanization is contingent and it could be undone, it's very real. Our next um, question is from Morten D. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a really uh, inspiring talk. Um, I'm trying uh, to understand your position exactly because I, I think I, I share it very much, uh, uh, except for when you said that I'm not a pacifist, uh, because you sounded very much like uh, one, but of course depends what exactly you mean by that uh, term. Um, um, and I think very 
uh, often when people say they are not pacifists, uh, what they mean is that they are not, uh, you know, somebody who would uh, never resist uh, violence, for example. And uh, in, in that sense, I'm certainly not a pacifist uh, either. But also historically, it seems to me to be very closely linked to, to what you were talking about, na namely uh, anti-militarism. And it's much more of an institutionalist and political uh, position. Uh, where you uh, want to abolish the institution of uh, of uh, of war and the war machine, just as you want to abolish the institution of slavery or the institution of of uh, of uh, slaughter. Um, so uh, sometimes when you criticize pacifism, it's uh, very much like when you say, uh, "What if you were about to starve to death and the only thing you could eat was a burger? Wouldn't you then uh, eat the burger?" <clears throat> so I, I just wanted to to, to uh, hear your uh, your views on, on the meaning of pacifism, basically. basically. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that comment. And, you know, I, I try in the new book to tell the story of the rise of transatlantic pacifism and um, how the movement made compromises that Tolstoy wasn't willing to make. Um, the mainstream of pacifist movements said, well, we will allow states to reserve a right of self-defense and our goal will be to create a, a, a system where they, they don't need to go to war because there will be settlement of their disputes. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I, I really appreciate your call for clarification and I, I, I hope you'll take a look at my attempt to kind of tell the story of how Tolstoy inspired a lot of uh, anti-war activism, especially conscientious objection among soldiers, which was his preferred uh, political response to war, but also a lot of others who had an ambivalent relationship to his own absolute uh, politics of nonviolence. Now, of course, even there, Tolstoy struggled. You know, at one point, he amusingly says, "Well, no, I didn't mean you can't kill a mosquito." Uh, so. Uh, I, all I wanted to say when I when I said I wasn't a pacifist is that my arguments, I think that Tolstoy's arguments that I'm trying to reclaim do not require um, ruling out the possibility of some just wars. However, just as you say, uh, most are unjust uh, and most fought uh, in the name of justice or fought protectually in the name of justice. Many even if you think there have been some fought for on you know, legitimate just cause have made the world worse overall. Um, consider the Libyan intervention of 2011. Uh, so my own view is, is let's say close to pacifism. I prefer the term anti-war because it, it just reserves the theoretical possibility uh, for a just war, or, you know, even if only as a matter of theory and it, it 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 it's mainly to try to avoid the typical argument you'd get especially in the american context well what about world war ii would you appease adolf hitler uh don't you need to leave room for some just wars and you know my suggestion is the thing i'm concerned about um and that i'm using tolstoy to help think about doesn't require taking you know his own pacifism all the way uh, we could take it most of the way and oppose most wars uh, and make an argument that there's a risk in any war, just or unjust, that its humanization could involve its perpetuation. And if that's true, then we, we've focused in the place I want to focus for the purposes of thinking about the war on terror. A question from Andreas. Yes, uh, thank you also very much for your talk. Um, I'm quite interested in this comparison between war and then slavery and non-human animal slaughter, uh, especially because it uh, so clearly leads us onto what you also call beyond conse conse consequentialism uh, with Tolstoy, that uh, just as we think today that slavery is inherently evil, we also uh, get the idea here that war should be condemned in all its different forms. 
as uh, evil. But even if we grant that argument, which as uh, you've discussed now, we shouldn't necessarily do, uh, one might still discuss whether uh, with Tolstoy or not, we have a clear definition of what counts as being a war in the first place. Because just as the, 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 the discussions about slavery today, I think, attest, it's not clear, uh, even if we have these ideas of a practice being inherently evil, what counts as being such a practice. For instance, when we talk about uh, modern slavery, there are so many gray areas and I think it's also clear when we talk about uh, both international wars and civil wars today that there are also many uh, conflicts, uh, for instance, the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict today, where we're not quite sure whether to classify it as a war in the first place. And I was just wondering whether you think that Tolstoy can also help us in this regard. I, I really appreciate that question. I, I don't think he can, but as I've suggested at the very end, maybe he can help us think in a, a broader way than just kind of locating the boundaries of the categories. So his analogies um, really presuppose his opposition to violent corporal practices. That's, they, they all share that characteristic. Um, and he also engaged uh, imprisonment, notably in, in his last novel, Resurrection. Um, and I, I, I think it, it, one way to take his argument would then be to make a list of the violent corporal practices uh, and then decide what counts in each category. I think, you know, if he were here, his answer would be, but I haven't condemned any individual practice. I've condemned the whole list. And, and the way I've tried to end the lecture is to say, I think he actually went beyond that uh, and was because he was actually condemning domination, not violence. And the reason that matters now is that we see um, with, with the fall of violence, the way that um, transcending violence can actually exacerbate domination. Uh, and Honestly, Israel is a good example. Now we've just lived through this, uh, you know, set of events that uh, we've focused on precisely because it looks like it was war and moreover, inhumane war. And just as Tolstoy would have feared, the, the debate partly got caught up in whether you can bomb that building, uh, whether the, the, the strikes are humane, what it tells us about uh, Hamas, that it strikes with indiscriminate weapons. Well, that's the, for, for Tolstoy, I think that's the wrong debate. Um, uh, this is a situation, I think, you know, of, of normally nonviolent control. It's, it's the rulership of one people by another that occasionally, rarely breaks into war uh, and into excessive violence. Now, of course, every day it breaks into excessive violence because you know, war is not the only kind of violence you see in that part of the world. But actually, historically, it, the Israelis invented the idea of control uh, in the form of a humane occupation under law. And the day after 9-11, Americans began to learn from Israel about how to fight the war on terror, which Israelis had been fighting uh, for years and precisely under law and by with many of its reformers and audiences demanding that it be humane. And so I think Tolstoy would look at this and say, what is the relation of domination that is the problem that needs to be denounced? Uh, and 
not focus so much um, on whether this is a war, if it is one, whether the violence is towards civilians is too great, or whether if they're human shields, they deserve it or whatever. He would say, this is only happening because we're allowing domination, indeed, often nonviolent domination. And the ethical thing to do would be to end it. Now, of course, that's easy for anyone to say, uh, but it should still be said. There's a little time left. If you have a question, uh, please put an, an X in the chat. Um, there's one question from Priyanka. Priyanka, please. Thank you, Christian. A very fascinating lecture. Thank you so much. I am interested in knowing if we take Tolstoy's argument with regard to war and extend it to the question of colonialism. Because there's a very fascinating relationship here because Tolstoy was considered as one of the greatest influences on Gandhi's thinking, particularly his text, Kingdom of God is Within You. And also this letter that he wrote to which Gandhi also responded in 1908, which was a letter to a Hindu. And the entire edifice of the struggle against colonialism for Gandhi becomes a moral ethical project. And one finds the kind of resonance that Tolstoy has on Gandhi's thinking on passive resistance and then creating a novel concept, delineating it from passive resistance in talking about Satyagraha. So if one translates Satyagraha, it stands for standing for truth. And to be able to do that, you have to be a very, very strong person, completely in control of your life, your action, and a lot of agency which is given to the individual. So now if I want to understand the, no the notion of nonviolence in Tolstoy, it was Tolstoy who influenced an entire civilization on taking nonviolence as a mode of agitation and actually succeeding in attaining independence without violence. So I would be interested in uh, knowing your views on this connection and also the extension of Tolstoy's thinking on domination and colonialism. Thank you. Good. Thank you for that question. You know, as you've already said, Tolstoy was just a titanically influential figure uh, for a few decades. Uh, and in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, it's sad that we almost have no book about the forms of his influence. There's, there's, there's one pretty good book that, that tries in the Atlantic to look across the Atlantic space to look at different things. But of course we've known, you know, that, that, that Gandhi was so profoundly influenced um, by by the kingdom of goddess is within us. And I appreciate you reminding us. Um, so I would say two things. First, to be absolutely proper, and because I've myself tried to decenter violence, Tolstoy's philosophy was one of non-resistance. Um, and he he drew this directly from the passage from Matthew I put on the slides, Matthew 5, 39, uh, but I say unto you, do not resist one who is evil. Um, now, of course, much evil takes the form of violence and non-resistance to violence would mean non-violence, but I, I, I hope we could, you know, especially for the reasons I was getting at, um, make sure to um, take seriously that it, it was for, I believe, Gandhi as well, um, a, a philosophy of non-resistance. Um, so your, your broader question is, I think, really important. And, and I think it, it requires us to go beyond Gandhi because I don't think we can get an adequate, sorry, beyond Tolstoy. I don't think we can get an adequate understanding of um, imperialism from Tolstoy in part because he was a fan of the Russian empire. War and peace is if nothing else, a kind of, you know, apologia uh, for the Russian empire, at least in, 
its titanic contest with Napoleonic, the Napoleonic Horde. It's only fair to note that at the end of his life, uh, drawing on his own youthful memories of spending time in the Caucasus, Tolstoy wrote a remarkable novella called Haji Murat, which was precisely about a declining empire, namely the Russian, facing down Muslim terrorism at its own imperial fringes. And it's very laudatory uh, towards, uh, towards the enemy. Uh, nonetheless, you know, I think that we need to look elsewhere than Tolstoy to get to think about kind of the global implications of non-resistance or non-violence. Um, and especially since, as you've indicated, we're, we're dealing with, uh, in the 20th century, a, a lot of racialized wars that work across old colonial boundaries. And Tolstoy doesn't provide a lot of help understanding that. Um, and so I've only, you know, I began my talk by saying Tolstoy's one figure, one interlocutor from our canon whom we need, but we also need a lot of others. And that includes a lot of non-Western thinkers. Um, although of course, Tolstoy had a huge influence everywhere. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Thank you, everybody. We're running out of time. I had a, a list of questions on my own, uh, in my own notes here. I just wanted to end on, on one, Sam, kind of broadening uh, it out a little bit, because um, I think this is a really fascinating piece of work. And, and what it does is, th is that it really goes into uh, some of the most uh, pressing issues of our present. Um, so I was wondering whether you would elaborate a little bit on the role and practice of intellectual history uh, in this way of trying to take up um, pressing themes of the present. Um, do you see this as a, a model which could be copied, um, if you will? Um, do you see this way of doing intellectual history? Where do you see the kind of prospects of uh, influencing contemporary debates? Um, would you uh, elaborate a little on, on these questions? Of course. Well, no, I've begun the talk by, by denouncing Quentin Skinner in this regard. And, and, you know, it's not like I'm the only presentist. I, th I think our, our, our normal practice in, as historians, including intellectual historians, is to, at the very least, frame a topic in light of something we're concerned about in the present. Um, and you know, my premise in this lecture is that we have enough shared context in Quentin's term with Tolstoy that he can be part of our debate, that indeed he's an absent voice in it. Now, uh, you know, I'm ventriloquizing a lot too through him and choosing things I like from him. Uh, and you know, we, we will inevitably seek a, a usable past and the, the, the concerns that Quentin raised all those years ago are absolutely valid. I just don't think they should ever keep us from treating the past as something that, you know, we, we need for our present and future uh, because, you know, our thinkers are dead. They don't need us. We need them uh, if, if anyone does. And so I, I think that, you know, there's, there's absolutely a reason to, to impose responsibility on ourselves in seeking a dialogue with the canon uh, and investigating past thought. But if it's not for present uses, then what's the point? And so I, I see a lot of, of people um, in younger generations who are making are reaching similar conclusions and trying to find a more useful form of intellectual history than has prevailed perhaps in 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 recent decades. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, and thank you so much for for coming here today. Um, we hope to see you in, in Aarhus at another point of time, hopefully sometime in the, in the near future. 
And thank you everyone for, for showing up. Um, as we said initially, this has been recorded, so it might also appear somewhere, maybe on our webpage. We will have to look into that afterwards. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. And a final round of, of virtual applause for you, Sam. Thank you so much.